Hi, good evening everybody and uh, welcome to the Graduate School of Architecture Professional Practice Lecture Series and uh, this evening we're really honoured and delighted to have uh, Phil Mashabane uh, making a presentation to us and uh, we're looking forward to his contribution to this uh, lecture series that is part of uh, Krista Wassu's Professional Practice Series but also open to the GSA community. So we're really happy for uh, the big turnout tonight and uh, what we what we know is going to be a really fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, before I introduce Phil, I just want to share with you um, some information about some programs uh, at the GSA. Uh, we have been developing over the last uh, couple of years a new program. Uh, Professor Voss has been developing this and we're planning to launch it um, next year, the Postgraduate Diploma in Architectural Management. Uh, it's a really uh, fascinating structured course uh, that looks at all aspects of contemporary uh, architectural management, uh, looks at entrepreneurship, it looks at ideas about development as well as the other uh, core areas of professional practice. And uh, if you want to any information on that, you can email uh, Deshni Reddy. Her um, email address is provided at the bottom there, areddy at uj.ac.za. And Boitemel is going to type that into the chat. So if you would like some information on that, the Postgraduate Diploma in Architectural Management, please feel free to uh, email Adeshni and she will um, bring you into the loop about that, that programme. So um, I'm going to introduce Phil Ashabani now. Um, he is, as you know, a preeminent South African architect. His reputation precedes him. I actually met Phil around 20 years ago uh, at the Commonwealth Association of Architects conference in Bloemfontein and he'd already had a phenomenal reputation at that time that I know uh, he's built on uh, in the intervening period. In 1995, uh, Phil co-founded Mashabani Rose Associates, dynamic South African studio. They've done a wide range of really quite extraordinary projects working in a wide range of domains, not just architectural production, looking at urban design, development, museum design, what's known as storyline development, exhibit design. And uh, Phil also combines his engagement with professional practice at this level uh, with um, a range of other services that not so commonly associated with architectural practice, uh, but uh, certainly a very important part of practice for many architects. Uh, he's involved with uh, facilitation, negotiation, and also a commercial and construction arbitration, quite complex areas. Uh, he served and headed SACAP in the past and uh, is highly qualified, not just in architecture, but in law, project management, and as I mentioned, mediation and arbitration. So quite a, uh, a renaissance man and uh, a prolific uh, practitioner. So I think we're all really looking forward to his presentation this evening. Uh, before I hand over to Phil, uh, just to share with you, if you have any questions, there's going to be the opportunity at the end of his presentation, which should be around 45 minutes. There's going to be the opportunity for you to ask him any questions or to share any reflections you have on his presentation. Um, and there are two ways of doing that. You can either write them down and share them at the end of the presentation or you can put them in the chat. 
And Christo Vosloo, Professor Vosloo at the end is going to take over um, this chair and he will feel the questions and, and relay the questions to Phil. So feel free to put them in the chat or at the end there will be the opportunity for you to directly address your questions directly to Phil. Um, or you can raise your hand at the end as well uh, during the Q&A session and uh, Phil, uh, Christo will see that and then he'll be able to direct. So he will kind of line up the questions for Phil to answer. Um, so I think that's my 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 part done for this evening. So um, great pleasure uh, having you with us, Phil. We're really looking forward to your lecture and having you at the GSA um, and look forward to, to, to your contribution this evening. Thank you. It's over to me. Good. Uh, what do I see here? Good evening, Mike. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good. Uh, just so we can't see your presentation as yet. Yep. I'll, I'll be about, I'm just about to start with the presentation. No Mark, th thank you very much for introducing me the way you did, and uh, I'm, I feel highly honored to be given this platform as the uh, University of Johannesburg has always invited me to give similar talks to particularly students. This has been tailored to, uh, to help students to arrive at a position of decision making in their career. And of course, when students and even practitioners for that matter, <coughs> When you embark on a career, you make a decision where do you want to end up? Particularly, I've raised the question, people spend four or five years and six years as, an, uh, as a student in architecture until they qualify, until they write their professional practice exams, just for the purpose of being employed by others. And I found it, I've, over the years, I found it very difficult to accept. And we create these programs to enable students and everyone else who's in the built environment sector or platform to look ahead of who they are in relation to other people as what the communities are looking forward and looking up to architects and planners as solution providers. So my presentation is going to encompass, firstly, maybe the projects that, you know, I've been asked this question several times. What are your favorite projects in the host of projects that your office has uh, accomplished? And often I always say all of them are my favorites, but there are projects that which have got a certain element that takes me a little bit forward and puzzles me a little bit and say, any person who I deem as a good practitioner, he should find a solution for a needy area without being commissioned. You need to step forward and give a solution. Now, one of the projects that which uh, fits that envelope is the Hector Peterson Memorial, which we designed some 20 years ago. And it was a project that which came out of the situation in, a, in an office, in our office whereby, you know, you get a lot of time in an office, you don't have much work. But then when you look around and check on the environment, you realize that there's a need in particular areas. Then we started developing a response to those needs. And that need, having documented it, it was presented then to the city of Johannesburg uh, Development Planning with a suggestion that in the event that they want to attend to the infrastructure of that area, they should consider the strategies that we've outlined there. And of course, the city having bought that, they passed it on to some corporate who wanted to fulfill their corporate social investment obligations and they placed some money to establish this project. But of course, the, it could not be done by the corporate itself. It needed to be handed over back at the very embryonic stage to the community, and therefore a community trust was developed. Of course, it was a sorry to heritage trust. And being the founder of also the trust, I had to resign because they insisted that they wanted me to continue to deliver the project. But of course, the project rolled over, and of course, 
it's not easy because you need to engage with all sectors of society. You need to touch sides with all the stakeholders. Here and there as an architect, you'll come up against a lot of obstacles. And that's why perhaps then some of us have gone beyond to study negotiations at Harvard University because you need to enable yourself. You need to have people's skills to deal with these things. An architect, it's not just a person who would put pen to paper and come with a beautiful design, a beautiful picture. It needs to be built. It needs to be appreciated by those who use it. And that's that negotiation and engagement with everyone else that comes into play. Now, what I will try to share with you, it's the structures as well and of how I started off. But that's how everybody perhaps starts off. Others, when they start a practice and, 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 and move on in their lives, is because they are pushed by circumstances. At that stage, I worked for a practice whereby uh, everything was at risk. My income at the end of the month was not guaranteed. So I based my life on somebody's risk. And these, these are things that we need to grow to avoid. That's why when you study and achieve whatever you achieve in your career, have a desire to be the leader in your space so that you should make your own decisions. So having said that, uh, the company that I worked for could not guarantee anything. And then I decided to leave and say, I will carry my own risk. And I established then the Phil Mashabane Architects. And of course, uh, as you can see, the name is Mashabane Rose. Uh, Rose was uh, one of the uh, staff members who worked with me, but was a very committed person. And I realized that with a company battling, he was also going to be uh, affected by any changes that are happening in the company. And then I invited him to join me and I managed to change the company to Mashabane Rose Architects. And then we formed this formidable team. Now, there's a challenge now when you start a practice. You find yourself having to do everything. You've got to engage with clients, you've got to design, you've got to do all the statutory requirements, that is your tax and, and et cetera. And with the slides that I'm going to share with you, I will take you through that process where, you know, you, you've got to start creating a structure around you, right? And this structure, it simply means that those are instruments that would enable you to put your knowledge to practice, right? And of course, uh, how I landed my even my first project, yeah, which is something that I need to share with everyone else. There's a thin line between being very assertive or being assertive and arrogance. But I was very assertive because I knew that I know what I'm supposed to deliver. I'm, I, I saw myself as a fully fledged architect, uh, recognized in every space that which I need to part participate in. And then as I moved on and I approached one government department, I knocked at their door and demanded a project. And within three days, then I was called in, but not called in because there was a project. They've never had such an approach. I approached them with respect, but with very good assertion of what and who I was. And that's how I landed the first project. And of course, it begins a very complex project. It was a, a, a school and jointly tasked to deliver also a health facility. Throughout my travel from France, I was known to do leisure projects as well as health projects. So it became an easy thing. That's a project that, lo and behold, uh, having taken the brief and everything else from the client and did the quick presentations, within two weeks, the client signed off the design, right? And in the next four weeks, we do, developed all the documentation up to a level of municipality submission, which of course the client was surprised because the experience is that people take two, three months, six months for that matter before they reach that point. But it was the dedication that we had that we, we've given this opportunity, therefore let's deliver, right? Now, always in a company, there'll be a founder. And in this instance, perhaps we're talking about myself, the founder, right? And then you'd find an opportunity that what does the founder do? What, what, what is he involved in, right? And of course, he's an architect. I'm an architect. 
and then you are required to fulfill the obligations of an architect towards your client. And those obligations are not easily achieved if you don't have a full understanding of the legal instruments that you require. For example, the cli any client that you meet, you need to have an agreement of some sort. At, at times, you may have received a letter of intention from the client or invitation, followed by a letter of intention. But as an architect or a practitioner, you need to insist on an agreement because a letter of intention cannot be used as an instrument if there's a dispute. There should be an agreement. And of course, an agreement would lead to a contract. And a contract, then it begins to stipulate their, your rights as a professional and your obligations, and similarly, the rights of the clients and their obligations. Right? And those then be, are instruments that are legally binding. It has got the content that binds the two parties to deliver or to sing from the same tune or sing the same tune or from the same page to deliver what is intended, which is a project. Right. And of course, the contract then, there are situations whereby there should be a consensus. There may not be a full agreement. Some clients want to draft their own contracts. And if you belong to institutes like the South African Institute of Architects, it has got a drafted document that which people can use. It has been very well workshopped to close all the loopholes that which if the client draws their own contract, they will always keep the back door open. And you'd like to avoid that. And if there's a back door open, then you need to be, again, well vested with other legal platforms that you can use, whereby you'd find that in the process, you'd have to consult perhaps an external legal person to advise you or to help you understand what the client's intention is in the whole frame of the, of the contract. And of course, a fair contract should never be biased. And those are things that we as lawyers and architects or arbitrators will look out for. We try to eliminate those so that if there's any dispute, the dispute should be on subject matter, not on situations created to find a loophole. Right. I haven't said that you cannot all do those things all by yourself as an architect. Even if you are a, a one man show, you perhaps needs an accounting person who will assist you with all the legal obligations towards the statutory bodies, your SARS and etc. You'd need somebody who would assist you to enable you to register with all relevant bodies that govern your profession. And to, to the students, you know, those are things that you need to learn as an architect. Many uh, lectures I've given at UJ and many universities, I've always said this program of practical, of uh, professional practice should be taught from year one because if usually it's taught on the last term or semester and it, and many students have spoken to, they say it's not a sexy subject, so it needs to be taught, but largely it's about communication, professional practice is about communication. So having said all this, you'd need to have as an architect or as a practitioner, somebody to help you with all the legal obligations that enable your profession. But as you grow and move on, then you'd want to employ or bring in some other people to assist you. Of course, you'd need a human resource expert who will deal with all the company internal matters, the recruiting, uh, sharing the policy with the, uh, the, the, the particular staff, workshopping it so they should all understand, understanding the labor law. But not to, 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 to strangle the employee, but to help them understand that as, as they've joined the company, they become a partner in delivering a project. Therefore, they need to understand all the legalities of that, right? And of course, the human resource person will deal all with the administration, administrative matters of uh, if a staff member requires certain things and there are family needs and et cetera, those are dealt with by that person, not necessarily the, the founder or the principal. But in the absence of that, the principal who's got to deal with those things, he needs to be very knowledgeable about those things, right? And then of course, the principal 
would require as as the the cake grows or his obligations grows he would need somebody to assist him to manage the meetings to manage the communication and even to manage his own travel towards me to, to meetings and to meet clients right that is important to have a personal assistant it's not a luxury and uh, in some instances it's being called a, a receptionist but the receptionist would call, take the calls and etc when i started my practice we didn't have a receptionist because all the lines were ringing all over whoever is in the office will pick up the line and transfer it to the relevant person it's over a period of time whereby you we felt that when somebody knocks at the door or rings the intercom trying to enter the premises, he needs to speak to one central point, which is your receptionist, right? But the personal assistant plays an important role to assist the principal in doing his daily delivery deliverables. As I've already spoken about the account, accounting roles, you know, is to create that support system on the project. Also, the accountant would assist the principal or the practice to review certain contracts with respect to the projects that are being delivered in the office, whether it's profitable or not profitable. And I can't even tell you. Some architects, yes, we go to a point whereby we're able to calculate all those things and establish whether the project is profitable, can it carry us through? And of course, an accountant will assist you to deal with all the payments because you've got to start having other service providers either your IT people or the printing and et cetera. An accountant also will continue giving you all those financial reports that may be required by your prospective clients. Like for example, if you are to do a project for corporates or even government for that matter, if they're in doubt, if you've got the comp financial competency to deal with a project, because remember, as an architect, you outlay your own capital first before you get paid. Now, if you start a project now, you've got to, you're going to build the client in six months time. You've got a lot of money that you've outlaid and somebody's got to collect that money, right? And somebody like an accountant may advise you that you need some intermediate or interim payments to enable you to do the project. But those things need to have been discussed with the client right up front. that, uh, you know, some other clients would want to pay you at a particular time. And of course, it's indicated 30 days. It has never worked in this country. You never get paid even in 30 days. You're paid in 90 days plus, you know, which becomes a difficulty in, in running a project. Right. Now, having said that, all these things, it's all about how you communicate the intention. The intention is to deliver a project. But then you've got all these elements and people around you and team that enables you to achieve that, right? And then as soon as you start going to site, then you need to begin to understand the policies uh, that is legal and the policy frameworks of that particular site that you're dealing with and any other element that is surrounding, surrounding the project. Local government, they've got their own specific legal requirements. You need to understand the city land use schemes, for an example. You need to understand if there's a need for an environmental control, if it, the area is environmentally controlled. For an example, in, in the residential areas, you cannot set up a workshop and et cetera. Those issues begin to be considered. And of course, they need to all to plug in onto the city, city planning bylaws. And when you go beyond outside now the specifics of the uh, local authority, the first document, of course, before you even embark on anything, you need to have in your possession from your client the title deed, which has got all the prescripts of what that site can do or achieve and et cetera. And that needs to be read in conjunction with the land use scheme or the development scheme from the city, right? But when you go beyond the city environment and et cetera as a local authority and looking at other piece of legislation from the government level, having received the title deed, it may have certain uh, restrictions. 
And then you need to employ, for example, uh, town planners who can assist you to apply for the removal of particular restrictions, provided those restrictions or the removal thereof is supported by the community in which that building is going to be developed. And that, that will bring you then to a bigger understanding of the environmental management framework, how certain things need to be done in that particular space. And some other areas, of course, are very sensitive, whereby they'll be subjected to, you know, the local authority or the government or your typical um, uh, SARA, South African Heritage Resources Agency, would require you to have conducted an environmental impact assessment that is not only about the structure. Many years ago, I did some projects in the, or in fact, I, wasn't, I was not doing the project as the chairperson of the South African Heritage Resources Agency with the developments happening in the wine lands. The wine farmers wanted to build huge structures which were beginning to begin to impact on the visual or the visuals of the wine lands. And those they come under that and that umbrella or that tick box of the environmental impact, the visual impact of what you do in a space as much as you in build in cities. But then there's Dubai, it has defeated everything else. Everything is so high and et cetera. If such buildings which you see in Dubai were to be built in Johannesburg, you'd, you're going to have a lot of people objecting to those because they begin to impact on the environment in terms of having huge buildings which create a shadow over other properties for a longer period that, than it can be tolerated. Then, of course, at the national level, you've got uh, lots of pieces of legislation that needs to be considered, even at primary level whereby you are still uh, dealing with the local authority. You need to look at the piece of legislation which has been developed by the National Heritage Resources Agency, which is the National Heritage Act. For example, in the urban areas, or there are buildings that are over, the, over 60 years old, they're automatically protected. There are buildings that have got a history, or there's an environment that has got a particular history. I urge people to familiarize themselves with those pieces of legislations. And of course, you've got the national building regulations, which are instruments used by local authorities to approve your building plans and et cetera, whether they fit within the building standards as would be accepted, being articulated in the development schemes but or the land use schemes. And of course, that would bring us to Spluma, whereby you know the spatial planning and land use becomes an issue with all the influx of people coming to the cities seeking accommodation, either to work or to reside. That piece of legislation is used now to determine whether, having understood the movement of the people, if certain existing structures can be sacrificed for a different use. And that is, of course, tied to the development process which has been uh, developed at national level. The good thing is that it's so flexible. No piece of legislation is cast in stone. Any piece of legislation, I always urged when I practice law that it's a guide. As soon as it is argued or mitigated by other circumstances, it is likely to change. And that's what we find then as we move forward, right? And within uh, local authorities in the municipality areas, then you've got neighborhood organizations. Like for example, in Johannesburg, you'd have your Park Town Residence Association and every little suburb has got their residence associations. Those are the watchdogs of what is happening in their neighborhood. And those are the people who comment on any development. But bear in mind, they are not the decision makers. They would comment as a stakeholders, but the decision maker would be, for example, your Prague, which is your uh, provincial heritage resources agency in Houting. But we've got nine of those. Every province does have that. So should you land with a project or find yourself having to work in any of the areas, those are the institutions that you need to check. At the time when I was president of the Cons of uh, South African Heritage Resources Agency, and later I established the provincial ones, 
I used to insist on developers that, and architects that familiarize yourself and have a relationship with this authority so that they should guide you off the do's and don'ts. There is no point of getting a commission from a client and you start drawing this beautiful building, functional building, on to find that it falls outside the controls and the parameters of the acceptable standards by the plug. And then you've got to revisit and the client begins to be so unhappy about you because the duty of an architect right from day one, you need to advise your client of the do's and don'ts. They may not agree with you, but you need to put it out there and of course, let it be reduced to writing so that there should be a record that you engage with the client, right? And of course, you've got the local authority as well. Look, local authorities in our time, you would not just submit your building plans. You'd prepare them and go and engage the local authority as to whether it meets the standards. That used to shorten the process of the approval because you already do what would be approved within their standards. The architect's knowledge is not absolute. We need to begin to engage with all these 11 bodies that have been established. And of course, in the event that your application or your endeavors have been shot down, you've got an opportunity that it can be taken to some tribunal to review the decision taken. And of course, if it fails there, then it still goes to the, to the appeal authority of those structures. And those are instruments that have been put so that they can enable architects to be able to better inform their clients as they move on, right? And of course, when you contemplate a project, as I've mentioned earlier, I've mentioned the title deed and the land use scheme. These are the very key instrument uh, documents that you must have as an architect before you put pen to paper. But the unfortunate thing is that we just continue and want to knock the building and just continue designing without considering all these things. And it becomes a problem because that's where a lot of delay happens in achieving or realizing what you needed to do, right? And as soon as the building operations have uh, been initiated, <clears throat> there are a lot of risks and there's a lot of oversight either from the architect or the contractor, which may subject the project to be to be stopped in one way or the other. Stop orders would be issued. But it is the duty of the architect to be able to advise the contractor of the do's and don'ts, right? Because we've got all range of contractors. You know, you get a contractor who's got a wheelbarrow and a bucky, and he's got one guy working for him. And we've got well-established contractors who've got all the uh, resources and project managers within themselves and development managers within themselves who look into these things so they should avoid any delays that may be caused by any type of an oversight. And all these stop orders may come because of building hours. You know, when the contractor is under pressure and the architect is under pressure from his client to see to it that this project is delivered on time, you'd find there'd be a motivation to work long hours, to work over weekends and et cetera. And the neighbor would watch which are these structures in the neighborhood can put a stop to that, right? And of course, when the project is going ahead, when the site is handed over, it is the architect's duty as a principal agent to seek from the contractor how he's going to manage his materials which are coming on site. And anything that lands on the pavement, it would need a permission from the local authority. And those are the things that may cause and bring about stop orders of any sort. And Johannesburg, as an example, it's known as the largest man-made forest in the world. And people who came before us, they've taken pride in planting trees on the sidewalks and in their properties and et cetera. Whilst the Heritage Act does not protect the trees, but the locals, the local communities can argue against a tree that is perhaps badly treated by the development or trees that needs to be removed for the purpose of the development. But it's the duty of the architect again. At the stage where you engage with your stakeholders, you point out all the things which are deemed to be fixes so that your design should 
fit in on the elements that which the communities are, are, are appreciating as you move along. And of course, it's the duty of the architect to see to it that the contractor that is appointed, he's registered with any institution, like for an example, in our case here in, in South Africa, we've got the South African Building Contractors Association. Those are bodies which are not necessarily there as people perceive them to hinder the progress or the development of the contractor. But those are the ones which have got, who can give guidance as to how the contractor needs to conduct himself in delivering the project. And of course, if you've got a good contractor, then you end up being a well-recognized good architect, you know. And of course, in a practice then, the, um, the principal or the founder cannot do it all by himself, right? As the practice is growing, he would need certain individuals suitably qualified to run with specific needs of the practice. Then those perhaps the mid called managers, people are managing different sectors of the, of the practice. And in this instance, perhaps you may have a development manager. And what are his duties? It could be at some point he's seen as a marketing manager. It's a person who goes out there and meet clients and find projects. And also, even if there's a project that he didn't bring into the office, it has been brought by perhaps with the principal, he would look at it and check its viability, whether it's a project that is going to dig deep onto the pockets, onto the coffers of the practice, or is it a profitable project before you take the commission, right? So it becomes an, an important individual who does all the analysis of anything that it's in the, in the office. And he'll continue doing the risk assessment on the project if it has been commissioned and it's, it continues to be delivered. What are the risks which arise as we deliver this project? And he'd advise the principal to engage with the client and see how that risk can be mitigated. He'll be also involved in the internal communications with the various uh, participants within the office, even the professional team, to create a, a master organo organogram of the organization of how the work needs to flow and what resources would be required, right? And some other practices as they grow, and the, the more projects you have in an office, particularly if you end up at least having more than three projects, then you need somebody to internally how, help you to manage as a practitioner those projects. Then you get your internal project manager. That's the project manager who looks at the bolts and nuts of a project, whether it's costing the company some money or whether the professional team or the technical team is delivering onto the project in time to realize the profits. So he'll do all those and even to resource the, 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 the project itself. He's the one who may make suggestions to the principal that we need a few more hands to achieve this if we need to achieve it on a particular time frame. But then it's when the project, the company is going, handling more than one project at a time. You need that assistance. But some principals or owners of companies, they delegate that perhaps to their PAs or their office manager, which we'll speak about shortly, right? And of course, that internal project manager would always continue monitoring each and every project if it will meet its deadline. And if there are any challenges arising within the office to deliver on time, he's the one who'll have a solution and move forward with those suggestions to the principal, right? And of course, you know, a lot of companies may, may or may not have an office manager but you need this person who, look, who looks at the infrastructure. Like for example, Phil Mashabani, if I'm not in my office and there's a storm and the roof is off, who take that responsibility? It would be this office manager who's been mandated to take care of any other thing that may break or supplement anything to enable the office to work. 
if any IT instruments that are used in an office fails in one way or the other, of course, he shall have heard from the user that my computer, my laptop is failing. The office manager would make those resources available, either to go and buy one or engage with any other medium to make that available. Then it becomes a very important aspect in an office in continuing to deliver the project. And of course, having said that, then you've got the engine of the of a, of a project. The people who, having taken the design either from the principal or if there's a design team that would do all those pretty pictures, but workable, buildable things, the project architect takes it over. But also the same project architect need to have familiarized himself with all the legislative framework of delivering the project. He cannot take it for granted that this has been dealt with. Therefore, I'm just putting pen to paper to develop this building. And in his process, he would need the assistance of technologists. You know, some other companies, like at some point, you find that you've employed, as a principal, you've employed five architects, you don't have a technologist. But then you would find that you need to have a project architect. And in that way, you've reduced other architects to be technicians of this architect. It's something that I've tried to avoid throughout my career. When people go to colleges and institutions and qualify and be recognized as architects, I would expect them to work as architects, right? And of course, you need technologies, people who research information for you and assist you to deliver the project, right? Having said that, then you've dealt with all that, but at the same time, there's a need to accommodate intents. You know, universities, they make, they would persuade us to accommodate some of their students to fulfill certain of their programs and et cetera. And of course, I've always insisted and I've always spoken in this case, Professor Foslow would remember when I said, please, when the students approach private practices, they should not say they are looking for work. Because them being there, it's an extension of their education. Um, big names that are known throughout the world, your Norman Foster, for you to be an intern there, you actually pay to be there. They don't pay you. But in this country, we're still candidate to accepting people who want to promote and develop this profession and would need the assistance of everyone else in, the, in our journey, right? Now, having spoken about the technical team, the slide that we are looking at now, it encompasses all the operational structure. As you can see, then you've got the principal who's the founder. As I've mentioned earlier, the principal may start only with an accountant just to help him with all the legal frameworks that enable him to start the practice or deliver a project. But other complexities come in, right? He's got to employ people. Then he have an external. This is how the architecture is moving. It's very rare that you should find an architectural practice that has got all these components under one roof. The profession is moving at outsourcing some of these functions. Then you'd have your external human resource who understands the company's policy, who understands all the labor, uh, labor law challenges that may arise out of staff and, and running a practice. And then, of course, having said that with the principal having received a commission, he may, like myself, it's all well and fine, I'm trained in law, but I always seek a second opinion. Then I'll go to an external legal expert to review the contract that I've got to sign. Those are the things that we, we need to begin to look at. Now that operational structures I've mentioned earlier, then, then you've got your personal assistant assisting you. You've got office managers assisting you. On there, you've got your development manager. You've got your internal project manager. And then it, this forms a composite structure of any practice. But if it's a one man show, you end up being the principal, having the accountant, having an external legal expert, you may have your personal assistant, perhaps human resources, and any other thing, which is your office management, which uh, the duties may be delegated to your personal assistant or your receptionist. Or you may 
as an architect, of course, we are trained project managers. You know, it's, it's one responsibility that we've abdicated as architects. That's why today we've got even uh, councils of project managers, because architects have seen themselves as people who just do the pretty picture, but not to manage the project, not to call meetings, not to coordinate the meetings with other consultants. And the project managers, they got born and now they've taken over. Up to this point, the unfortunate thing is that any government work, when government contemplates a project manager, they'll speak to the engineers. And then in the end, you're going to be managed by an engineer on an architectural project, which is a travesty. And we're trying to mitigate the situation and bring the dignity of an architect into space as we go along. Right. Now, having said all these things, you move into a space of how you connect with people. You need to have a name if you start a practice. And if you don't have a name, you need to be a known individual having done substantial work or having participated in every sphere of built environment to get respect. And of course, people would need to communicate with you. You'd need to have an email address and be warned. The Gmail address is not recognized by very corporate, by many corporate bodies. They see it as kind of a fly by night practice if you're using a Gmail have an established email address that which gives you dignity. And of course, Facebook and, and Twitter, those are platforms where it, we begin to chit chat and other architects which I've seen, they've seen it worse. You know, I had great respect for LinkedIn, which you see here, but many architects now, it's no longer a networking of professionals. People begin to post what they do and et cetera. And I don't know whether it's the right platform, but those are platforms that which you need you need to have within your practice, which promote your work. And that brings me to the question: How do we? How do you market yourself? You firstly, you know, I've been approached by a lot of uh, architectural magazines. They want to do a lot of write up about our works. But for you to put at any picture or any text on that. They want to charge you. And I always refuse. I said, these magazines, they've come into existence because of our contribution. They use our materials to keep their magazines alive. Therefore, often I refuse. I'll say they actually pay me. They should pay me for making available any of our works to be in their, in their magazines. Other people see it as arrogance, but you need to assert yourself, particularly with the advent now of um, certain works which are open for use by everyone else, which would be a work. You know, the copyright laws are being revised and they're going to expose many of us who are trying to protect our work because the legislation in simple terms when it summarizes, it simply says it can be used provided it's used in the best way and in the best interest of the community. But who's the community? when your work is being used. Now, we've reached a point, all what I've spoken about, you can look at all these right from the principal, the founder, and HRPA accountant, professional practice, managers, operational structure, and branding. It is nothing more than communication. Nothing gets delivered if the communication is poor. Nothing will be achieved if the communication is not very clear. So architecture is the communication of how people or the environment can be dealt with and people be accommodated. And that you are communicating to the people, to the end user. And even for the proponents and people who propose that, that is all communication. Thank you so much. That's the end of the slides. I'm happy to take the questions moving forward. Um, Phil, you, Phil, you may be, um, remove your presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me. So you can click the X next to the leave button. Big pardon? 
So there should be an X um, next to your leave button, the red button. Just just before that, there's an X. Yes. So the same. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I've been looking at the comments and uh, people have been very complimentary about the content um, that you've delivered. And thank you. I, I think you've done well in, in highlighting that, you know, how one, how one should practice and what practice um, entails. So um, for, to, for the questions, um, Okay, let's first get to get all the live questions. So those of you who would like to ask a question yourself, if you can please raise your hand. Thank you. Oh, there's, there's, those of you who are not familiar with Teams, on top, on the right hand um, top side, the third icon. Reactions. Reactions, you can go to reactions. Um, Read me from the chat. Platform. Okay, questions. So while everyone is writing the uh, questions in the chat, I'll just read through some of the comments. Um, should I read the comments? Okay. No questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I maybe this one. Okay. Um, this is a great presentation from Lloyd. Um, not paying students when people leave university after their three years de degree or diploma, they are qualified and should be treated as employees and should be paid. Um, perpetuating the terrible norm of low payment of qualified technician by branding it as extension of education exclusively is exploitation. Maybe for, I'll respond to that because I know where you come from. Yes. Uh, you're talking about students in their second yes. year. Um, yeah, particularly, yes. Doing, doing work integrated learning or experiential learning in a practice. Yeah. Uh, and not as someone with a qualification behind them already. Yes, yes, you're right, Prof. However, uh, if I may further respond to that, Professor Foslow, if, yes, if, if, if a practice takes on a student on the work in integrated learning, now, such a student cannot be given a task to deliver on any project because there's a high level of risk, right? And of course, bear in mind that when you come to a practice, you're not coming with your own infrastructure. The company is going to provide with infrastructure and everything else at their own cost. And that's why over the years I've insisted that this is an extension of your education. When you enter the office, all the interns that come to my office, I always insist that when you cross the gate threshold, switch off your cell phone because your family knows exactly, because as much as you go to your university, they know that you're in the university. They won't send you text messages or phone you during lectures. Even at my office, that's how we treat it. It's, it sounds a bit harsh, but we're trying to minimize the loss of time, the time that falls between the cracks, and enable the student to understand whatever he needed to understand when it comes to our practice. But should such a student be used for a fee on an ex, on a fee earning exercise, the students would be recognized for that. But in a nutshell, students should always understand that on your second year going to a third year, you are still learning. And of course, for example, if I need to ask for, uh, answer further on those who are who've got their piece of paper, their certificates, and etc. You are only an architect academically until you write your professional practice exam with the relevant body, with, with your SIA, uh, with your SACAP. You're not an architect. You're an architect academically only, but not in practice. And then you've got to spend that two years being trained by a practice 
to understand the industry, to understand the application of the knowledge before a company gives you any work that you can run with as a project architect, right? But those are the things, I mean, when, when, I, when I graduated in France some many years ago, my first employment, which necessarily was not an employment, the company had advertised for a post for a person who's got 10 years experience post registration. What did it take? It means six years of your studies, two and a half years of your training, and you write your exams. That's already eight and a half years. Plus 10 years of experience, you need to have been involved in projects for 10 years. We're talking about 18 and a half years. My response was that I don't have that experience. I'd like to come and work for you for no pay. Because for six months, because I want to earn some experience from you. And remember, at that stage, I'd already passed my, my, my professional practice exam. But within a month, they recognized my input. On the second month, they gave me a permanent position. And this is what I'm trying to pray, pray to people that you, the question that needs to be asked, why did you choose to be an architect? Why are you an architect? It is to do the work on the built environment. It's fine, you need to be paid. But have you done your bit? In practice, we've received applications from people. They come from various universities with a master's in architecture. But when you ask them to do something, they're still developing a pretty picture. They can they'll develop that pretty picture, but not being able to make it buildable. Even understanding the standards of the office. Right. But I'm not trying to shoot down the students, but my presentation or lecture today, it says leave to what you studied for. To be an architect. The title does not make you an architect but your work and your deliverables make you an architect. Thank you, Professor Oslo. Okay, we, we received some questions. Uh, um, I see there's a question, someone raised their hand, but I can't quite... Um, okay, it's Lerato. Lerato. Your question, put your question to Mr. Mashabane. Um, hi, Mr. Mashabani. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I really enjoyed the elaborate business, business structure that you um, illustrated in your, in your presentation. Um, I personally have struggled with the architectural profession in undergrad to a point where I decided to quit at some point, but then because I do love architecture, I'm very passionate about it. Um, I became very stubborn and decided to continue with my studies. But um, I still find myself in discussions with uh, my fellow classmates that um, really cannot pin down the idea of being an, arch an architect struggling with council submissions and floor plan and whatnot. How, my question really is, um, how do you find non-conventional approaches of practicing compared to just continuing with what you've learned at school? And also, this is just coming from the fact that um, while we do get insight of non-conventional practicing, it's very minimal. Um, architecture school is basically just based on buildings. So do you find um, non-conventional ways of practicing to be putting students at ease? Yeah, well, <clears throat> perhaps I may not understand what is deemed a, a non-conventional practice in architecture. The practice of architecture is just a fixed, it's a fixed thing. But if you bring a non-conventional, it means a person not complying or acknowledging any regulatory frameworks that govern the profession. Mm. Now th that becomes a problem because uh, one of the SACEP's uh, ethic codes or the, the mandate of SACEP, the South African Council for Architectural Profession is to protect the public. Now, protecting the public against who, against what? It is to protect them against these unconventional methods that which certain people want to adopt for gain, but not to deliver the project mm. efficiently or to the 
desired mandate or the mandate that has been put forward, right? Mm -hmm. Now, and of course, it could be another lecture talking about SACAP and, and its mandate and et cetera, how it impacts on the profession. But we need to recognize that their inexistence for a particular purpose, it is to deal with all these unconventional approaches in delivering architecture, right? Except if I didn't understand your question about unconventional, but my interpretation of that is something out of the norm. We, yes. need to stick, we need to stick by the rules. You know, that's why there are regulations. They need to govern and one leads from one point to the other for a successful project. Um, I think maybe let me just say, um, compared to designing um, buildings, you decide that you want to design um, door handles. So your yes. whole practice is just um, focusing on doors and whatever has that has to do with doors. Yes. Do you think that would be a much better approach for somebody who is um, struggling with the idea of just sitting down and becoming a technologist? All right. Okay. The um, I'll just give you one background. The institution where I studied, National École de Bazaar, it did not only teach us or put us on an architectural program. I got trained as an engineer. I got trained as a quantity surveyor, and I got well trained in communication. And in my view, why did they do that? In the event that you cannot be a designer, not everybody is gifted, and nobody can, not everybody can learn how to design and do it effectively. Mm -hmm. So if you drop off, therefore, if you're a good communicator, if you're a good administrator, then you end up perhaps being a project manager, right? Yeah. And and proudly, I could share with you that even at my first employment, the portfolio that I had, it was not about design. It was out there, you get all designers. My portfolio was about how to build. It was just details, which yeah. brings me to door handles and etc. Deciding what type of furniture can come in a particular space. And every architectural practice would need such people. But then that exercise was done by architects. It has been outsourced now. You know, you've got uh, your all your ironmongery companies, which would take your drawings and your specification and advise you what type of door furniture you'd need for that particular environment, right? It's a speciality on its own, but it's all within the framework of architecture. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, You're welcome. welcome. There's a question from Sumpiwe. Sumpiwe, please put your question to Mr. Mashabane. Uh, evening. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, firstly, Ndate Phil, thank you for such an informative uh, presentation. It's it's really um, getting the opportunity to hear sort of the practical side of the operations of a practice, how to start, so on and so forth. Um, once again, really, thank you so much. Um, my question is, say, for someone like myself who um, who wants to start a practice of his own um, after accreditation, what would you say are the what would you say are the biggest challenges that someone like myself would face um, when when starting a practice, especially considering the economic climate that South Africa is currently in and um, clients and yeah. financial challenges, so on and so forth. What would you think is the biggest challenge um, in starting a firm as well as essentially finding clients? And leading on to my second question, how exactly do um, architects actually market themselves? Because you mentioned that you somewhat had a problem with displaying your work in these magazines, given that they want to charge you for you to put yeah. your work in there. How do architects um, market themselves? Or if is is there or if is there is another way for um, professionals to market themselves other than the whole referral kind of stream to that? Yeah. Okay, I'll start with your first question. You know, in, in my world where I come from, I always said a good architect is a person who would identify 
and need. And this has brought about the existence of um, project developers. They go out there, they see a need. For example, if you look at the whole John Speck, if you're to study the the movement of the people, you'd know exactly which direction is the city growing. Then you are likely to identify a piece of land, whether it's owned by someone, but you could put a proposal to that piece of land, right? And share it with the owner. And in that way, you've already started your own project. As I've mentioned, how we started uh, Hector Peterson Memorial. When I drove around Johannesburg and all of Houting and, and the country, it became one of the sites which I noticed that there were, it was the most visited place where Hector was uh, commemorated by the then uh, ANC Youth League. And having noticed that there's not much infrastructure that accommodated tourists, even the locals, I put that strategy in place and presented at first for free to the city of Johannesburg. Later on, they paid for it, and then it grew into a project. And it became a significant project that led to other projects of um, legacy projects. But of course, if you want to start a practice again and you don't have work, participate in competitions. In Paris, I worked for a competition practice. Mashabane Rose Architects, most of our work came from competitions. We participated in competitions. We won some of them, which have sustained us for 35 years. We lost some, and those that we lost became second. Of course, we reimbursed of all our party, party expenses. So that's the strategy of how you create your own work. Participate in those platforms of competitions. You know, other competitions, it's not projects that can be awarded to be built but it's to recognize you, the ability of the architects. Then it puts you out there on that platform of being recognized by your peers and any other person that in the event that we want a typical thing, let's say like Mashabane Rose Architects, we've cut our niche in museums and or institutions. People think about us, even if they don't appoint us on many, some of them where we're not appointed, then we become advisors to the client. We help the client to formulate the brief together with the architect. So my response to how you get work, it almost answered your question of how you market yourself. You market yourself by your ability. When I speak to these magazines, I said, you approach me because you want to use our work. We have already marketed ourselves to yourselves. How better are you going to put us out there except on a magazine and etc. right? And it's pretty expensive if you start a practice. I mean, I've just won an award, uh, which I've got to collect soon, um, having designed the Museum of African Liberation in Zimbabwe. But the promoters are British. And now with the rent battling, I cannot afford just even to put a one page advert because it's going to cost me 55,000 rands. And if you put such money out there, you'd expect some returns sooner to close that gap and it all often it's not possible so to market yourself associate yourself with the platforms that which speak architecture developers and etc share your views with them and others as i mentioned earlier your people's skills would market to you the skill comes later right i don't know if i've asked uh, answered you little uh, you, I think you answered it very eloquently. Thanks. Um, Thank you. Um, there's a question here. How important is work integrated learning? Um, some Technicons and universities are phasing this out. And your views yeah. on that? <laughs> well, it is important until it's phased out completely. But however, uh, just to share with you, I chair the, um, the School of Planning of School of Architecture and Planning Advisory Board at Vets University. And by that, what we do, 
we're trying to integrate what the industry is doing with what students should be or what their curricula should be. Not necessarily preparing them for the industry, but they need to be abreast with what the industry is all about, right? And of course, with the integrated learning, I've always said to students, if you want to learn more or you want to integrate your learning with the industry, if you just if you just drive down, down the road and you see an architect's office working on weekends and etc., why don't you walk in there and and lend a hand? Then there is a lot that you can learn from there. A couple of years ago, my son who studied, uh, he's today an accountant when he was studying and um, and of course everything was purely academic in accounting. He was not vested with what the industry and all the softwares that are used currently and the method that are used by accountants. And I made a suggestion to him that we had a neighbor who was an accountant said, why can't you make friends with our neighbor? So that he should take you to work, you should learn how the accounts office is working and what instruments are they using and what queries are they getting and what type of responses they need to deliver to their clients. So whether the work integrated learning is going to be phased out, but you'll still be faced with that element of needing to be exposed to the current affairs of your profession. One last question, uh, because I think we are way over time already. Um, the question is, um, have you dealt with a situation where your firm required arbitration to resolve a conflict? If so, was it difficult? <laughs> yes, uh, and the arbitration often comes, well, the, the ones which we faced at my practice, it's when clients don't pay. And of course, in the agreement, and the contract with the client, there are steps that have been laid out there. If there's a dispute, now this dispute was about payments, then you go to mediation and then you go to arbitration. And of course, you cannot necessarily jump and get a lawyer. You can get a lawyer to help with arbitration. You cannot jump and, and start issuing summons to go to court. Our courts are overwhelmed. Our courts have adopted a method that has this matter been resolved perhaps through arbitration and et cetera? Hence, then you find even on, uh, on, on labor law, then you've got the CCMAs and et cetera. Nobody just jumps. Yes, we've been exposed to that and we sit with situations whereby myself being an arbitrator, at times it's hard to, to, to decipher exactly what the outcome should be because there's frustration and anger and emotion so you'd rather pass on that exercise to an independent person would be very objective and just look at the documentation for what it presents. Hence, I'd always encourage my staff and everybody else, even if it's a, it's a telephone call pertaining to the project, reduce it into writing. It would help you if there's a dispute at any given point. That's very wise advice. Thank you very much. Um, all for answering the questions um, and for your, your excellent lecture. Um, I must say, I, I, most of this hardly a question in the in the chat line. It's all compliments to you, um, and Thank thanks you. thanks to the lecture that you've thanks for the lecture that you presented. So from my side as well, thank you very much. Thanks for agreeing to this, um, and thanks for always being available um, to assist. With, with some practical advice um, on programs and giving lectures to students uh, um, whenever I asked to do that. I really appreciate that. Um, and then secondly, also to the GSA Ops team for organizing it. Thank you very much. As always, it, um, you did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thanks to, and then lastly, but not the least, thanks for everybody for attending. Um, we hope you found it very uh, informative and useful. Um, there will be one last uh, lecture in the series in roughly a month's time from now. Thank you very much to everybody and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, and thank you to everyone else. Good evening. <laughs>